if you are working with your phone on your desk, it mm. decreases your productivity just by having the phone nearby. So now if I'm working, I like when I'm working and sleeping, my phone is not in the same room as me, which has really, really changed things because, you know, unfortunately, even the visual of the phone is a bit of a cue to pick it up and check it. Right. So mm-hmm. to just have it physically in another room um, has increased my productivity and improved my sleep. Hello, and welcome to the Art of Living Well podcast. I'm Stephanie May Potter, and I'm here with my co-host, Marnie Dotches marmette We created the Art of Living Well podcast to empower you to live your happiest, healthiest, and most authentic life. Each week, we will bring you inspiring and motivating conversations covering health and wellness topics, including fitness, mindset, food, travel, product reviews, and strategies from a variety of experts, including our own bank of knowledge. We are excited to educate, motivate, and inspire you to change the way you perceive health and discover your art of living well. Get ready to feel inspired. Hello, and welcome to episode 97 of the Art of Living Well podcast. Before we dive into our interview, um, it's just noticing that, you know, it's officially fall outside and while sometimes here in Minnesota it feels like summer, the leaves are really starting to turn all these beautiful shades of red, orange, and yellow. I just love being outside in the fall. Um, I know right around the corner is the fun, festive, and busy time of year coming up. You know, Halloween hits and then Thanksgiving will be here. And before we know it, you know, there's lots of social gatherings, holiday traditions, sweets, alcohol, family get togethers, and that can continue all the way into the new year. So Stephanie and I are kicking off our 30 day thrive during the holiday season program again. We created this amazing and supportive community last year, and we had such a wonderful group of women who absolutely rocked it during what can really be a challenging and stressful time of year to stay on track with health priorities. The start date for the group is November 8th, and it's 30 days, so it'll run all the way through December 10th. And don't really just take our word for it. Here's what a couple of our clients said from last year's program. I would recommend the 30-day Holiday Thrive program to anyone who wants to who wants help focusing on his or her wellness goals, whether it's nutrition, meal planning, exercise, meditation, self-care, and it's a very supportive environment. Another person said support was super helpful. The group chat was so fun and I really enjoyed seeing all the great things the other participants were doing. It was so inspiring. I loved the recipes and I looked forward to them each week. The weekly check-in I was able to, when I was able to participate, was really helpful. I very much felt supported by Marnie and Stephanie. It was helpful to hear that they have the same struggles, and even though they are further along on their path to wellness, the work of eating right, sleeping, moving is a daily goal for all of us. So please consider joining our 30-day Thrive During the Holiday Season community. For more details on what this program entails, head over to our show notes or the link in the bio on our Instagram page, and we look forward to having you join us. And now we are thrilled to introduce today's guest, Stephanie Berryman. Stephanie is a passionate facilitator, coach, and speaker. She has been in the field of stress management and leadership development for 17 years, providing hands-on practical support in stress management, relationship building, and leadership development training. This experience has inspired a deep passion for supporting people to reduce their stress, find a healthy life, work balance, and invest in themselves. Stephanie has written three Amazon bestsellers, including her most recent book, Working Well, 12 Strategies to Manage Your Stress and Increase Your Productivity, which we'll be chatting about quite a bit today. In her courses, keynote speeches, seminars, books, and articles, Stephanie shares her perspective about how to get through the tough stuff that life throws at you. She draws on her own experience to share how to make the most of your life in spite of challenges, how to build strong relationships, and how to cope with the inevitable stress and grief that is part of living well. Her mission is to support people to live more meaningful, connected, relaxed, and happier lives. What a great mission. 
In our conversation with Stephanie today, she gives us so many tips and strategies on how to um, change your mindset. And we talk about busyness and that that does not equate success. We talk about how important it is to rest and recharge and about how important it is to block time in your day to do the things you need to do and just about the distractions in the world and what we can do um, to not be addicted to you know social media and some of the other distractions that take away our focused you know time so we're working smarter and not harder. So let's dive into our conversation today with Stephanie Berryman. But first, a quick word from our sponsor, Good Health Sauna. It's time to relax, rejuvenate, and renew. Everybody wants to feel better. Everybody wants to be healthy and happy. Good Health Saunas is proud to provide top of the line infrared saunas that deliver the most impactful results for overall health and wellness. Infrared saunas produce penetrating heat to help you sweat and heal your body from the inside. Sweating on a regular basis can help you feel amazing. Numerous studies have been done to show the power of infrared sauna use to help you sweat. Health benefits of regular sauna use may include detoxification, immune system support, muscle repair, chronic pain relief, relaxation, deeper sleep, and so much more. There are a lot of reasons people buy Good Health Sauna. I just recently bought one at the Minnesota State Fair and I am loving it so far. From the moment of purchase to the delivery and setup, Good Health Sauna staff have been amazing. They answered all my questions and they did a fabulous job with the installation. I look forward to my new evening routine where I take a 30 to 40 minute sauna before I shower and go to bed. And I love how relaxed I feel and more importantly, how I am adding to my overall health and happiness. And best of all, it's a great way to remove toxins from my body daily. Good Health Sauna provides commercial grade infrared saunas for in-home and commercial use. Backed up with the best warranty in the industry, lifetime guarantee, and unmatched customer service. They have three stores, one at the Mall of America in Minnesota and two in Wisconsin, Appleton and Waukesha. For more information and to purchase online, go check out your special offer at www.goodhealthsaunas.com slash the art of living well. Hi, Stephanie. Marty and I are so excited that we connected a few months ago and we absolutely love the work that you're doing to help reduce stress and increase productivity in the workplace. And as a former and recovering CPA um, who wore billable hours and you know lack of sleep as a badge of honor, I can personally relate to the examples and insights that you share in your latest book. And I honestly wish I had these strategies back in my formative days. And I know that all the practical tips and strategies that you're going to share today will be of immense value to our listeners. And we love the title of your latest book, Working Well, 12 Simple Strategies to Manage Stress and Increase Productivity, which is in such complete alignment with our podcast mission and values, because let's face it, working well is really an integral part of finding your art of living well. So we just can't wait to dive into all your research and insight and, of course, talk about your latest book. So welcome. Well, thanks so much for having me. I am thrilled to be talking to you and, you know, you both do such amazing work too. And I'm excited to be listening to your podcast now. Thank you. Yeah. So Stephanie, everyone has a story and we would love for you to share your journey of how you became a professional leadership consultant and coach who has impacted thousands of people around the world to deal with stress and increase their productivity. Sure. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I came to it the way many people come to it because I really needed it. Um, When I was in my late twenties, I was, you know, one of those late bloomers. So I went back to university very late and I graduated from teacher's college and I had a $35,000 student loan and I was super stressed out and I got a job at working at a not-for-profit and it was a fabulous job, but it was not-for-profit pay. I was not able to pay off student loans. I was really stressed out and I was proving myself. It was my first big job. So I was working 12, 14 hour days. And it was, I was working with the Canadian Mental Health Association, which is quite ironic to stress yourself out working in a job where you're teaching people how to reduce their stress. And then I had all of these things going on. I was going out giving workshops on how to reduce stress, but I wasn't doing any of the things that I was teaching. (laughs) 
And then my uncle called me and my mom had been living in Mexico and he said, something is really wrong with your mom and I'm going to send her to you. She's your problem now. You need to deal with this. So my mom showed up in Vancouver and my mom is like a world traveler and she came out of customs without her luggage. And I was like, whoa, something is very wrong here. And it took us probably three or four months, but we got the diagnosis of Alzheimer's. So I went from having this incredibly stressful job, being really stressed out and broke. I was single. I was, you know, I was in that place of just tough stuff. And then I was also the primary caregiver for my mom who was living with Alzheimer's, which was just heartbreaking. And I thought to myself, if I don't start taking care of myself and doing all the things that I've been teaching other people to do, this is all going to come apart because I'm not going to be well. And, you know, having worked in mental health, I saw what stress did to people and I saw the mental illnesses that people got and I heard their stories. So I began to get very, very good at my own self-care and I stopped seeing it as selfish and I started seeing it as something that I had to do for my mom and something I had to do for the, I had 12 staff working for me. So I was like, I need to model this for them and I need to do this so that I'm a good manager for them. And I just, it totally changed my life, right? I started to, I was like, I don't have time to exercise. And I was like, actually, I can ride my bike to work, right? Like I started to build things in. It's like, I don't have time to see my friends. It's like, actually, if I don't see my friends, I'm going to lose it. (laughs) So I really, I really started to build it in. And then, you know, that was kind of three or four years of incredible stress, right? My mom eventually passed away. It was a very difficult time. And, you know, during those, those challenging times, you start to think like, what do I want to do with my life? My mom got Alzheimer's when she was 59. I'm like, well, she got, sorry, Alzheimer's when she was 55. She passed away when she was 59. And I was like, okay, oh, wow. I really want to do what I want to do and what I'm passionate about. And that is helping other people live lives that are really, you know, incongruence with who they are and what they want and helping people manage their own stress so that they're not in this situation. And they get to live good lives no matter how long life is. So I went back to school and I did my master's in leadership. And then I kind of transitioned into this, you know, wonderful business that I've had where I really get to coach people and help people manage their stress, reduce their stress, and then be really effective and productive at work so that they can have time and energy for their lives. You know, and I also coach people around strengthening their relationships because I realize how important that is. Oh, I love your story. I mean, you've gone through all these really hard challenges in life, but that clearly was like part of your path and your journey. And now you're living what you're coaching, right? Absolutely. Like it's, and and I actually love that. And I'm sure that you two probably feel this as well. It's like, no, I have to do this because I teach it and I coach it. So I better be living it. It's the best reason ever to look after myself and keep my stress in check and be, you know, really effective and productive. It's yeah, absolutely. So I'm wondering if we can dive into a topic that I know our listeners will be very interested in hearing more about. And it's how do you find more time in your day and become more productive? Um, I know people are always commenting on how busy they are, how stressed and busy they are. And, you know, busy isn't necessarily productivity or is it necessarily a good thing right unless it's like I don't know what are your thoughts on this I know you nailed it Marnie like busy isn't a good thing busy does not equal productive busy actually means we've taken on too much or we're not managing it well and you know Stephanie I think you said it really well at the beginning we wear that busy as a status symbol and this you know pride of like I must be doing really well if I'm super overwhelmed and stressed out and busy that must mean that things are going well in my life and that's one of the first things that I coach people on and talk to people about is changing that mindset to Mm -hmm. know that busy does not equal successful busy actually means there's a time management and an energy management problem And when you start to shift that mindset, because I think we often, we strive to be busy, right? You know, we've all been raised to work really hard and go, go, go and see that as success. So it takes some time to shift that. But once we shift it and you know what, for me, when I realized, no, if I'm busy, it means I'm stressed out. I'm overwhelmed. I'm not a great mom. I'm, you know, feeling a bit frantic and all over the place, which means I'm not as great at work as I want to be. That made me realize, whoa, I need to do things differently. 
So that is one of the very first things that I coach people on is how do you shift to go? Success means that I own my time. I own my schedule and I have energy at the end of my day because, you know, what I've realized through all of the, the difficulties that I've gone through is that, you know, our family and our friendships and our relationships are the most important thing. And so for me, success is having enough time and energy for the people that I love. And that's what I coach people on is change busy equals success to time and energy for the people that I love and the life that I want equals success. Okay. I just, I love that. And it's so, you know, it's simple. And I think coming out of this pandemic where we did have more time, um, and sometimes we were spending it more with our family and sometimes we weren't just depending on where people lived, right. And the situation. Um, but I think it's also easy to go right back, even though we spent over a year slowing down a bit, a lot of us, including myself are kind of right back into the rat race very quickly. And so I love at some point to talk a little bit about that too, because I think some of us have seen shifts, but then we haven't maybe incorporated them yeah. long-term into our, into our life. But at the end of the day, like the relationships we have and spending time with family and friends, really, I love what you said, that's success, right? That's. Yeah. And I think too, the pandemic has really made people realize that. Like when I, when I talk to people and, you know, clients about like, what have you missed the most? It's always being able to connect with their friends, their family, their relationships. And also I've had a lot of clients who have gone through big shifts, like the big, like, yeah, I don't like this job. I'm out of here. Life is too short or, Ooh, this isn't the right relationship and I'm going to make a change. Like it's been really interesting to see. And I, I think it makes sense, right? We've really realized like life is uncertain, you know, and time is not a given. And so let's get really clear about what we're doing with our time. And it's so precious, right? Yes. Like, like, I feel like, you know, going back to that idea of being busy, like one of the things that I think I've learned in these past few years is that I really do want to fill my time with the things that I want to do and the things that I care about and I'm passionate about and I love. And obviously you can't do that necessarily 24 mm-hmm. seven, but I don't want to just be busy to be busy anymore, just to not have a free block in my calendar. Cause I do think there are people that are afraid to have that time that's open. Like, oh my gosh, there must be something wrong with me because I don't have any plans or I have an evening free or whatever it is. And Uh, I think it's so healthy to have that open time. And, you know, unfortunately, we live I think in a culture that's just this like it's just all about productivity 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 and be busy and go 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 and you know having experienced different cultures I've realized this isn't North America doesn't really have it sorted right like having just lived in Australia for a couple of years like when there is a holiday nobody works like no one is going to call you on a holiday if you've told someone that you've booked a week-long vacation Nobody emails you. Nobody calls you. It's like, yes, that's the way it should be. And they've got that figured out. And that's, you know, honestly, that's also one of the other things I coach my clients to do is like, when your day, when your workday is done at five o'clock, you are done and you are in rest and recharge mode. And if you spend that time checking your emails and dealing with work, you're not resting and recharging which actually makes you less productive the the next day, right? So I had so many clients who came to me because they were super burnt out. They're working 12, 14 hour days and they still weren't able to get ahead and get on top of their work. And the very first thing I did was say, the workday needs to stop at five because when you take four or five hours at night to rest and to recharge your brain, like it's actually the brain science, right? Your brain is able to calm down the brain has limited abilities to focus and concentrate and they get depleted throughout the day. And instead of being really smart people and taking breaks and stopping work at five. And I was like this too. Right. And I thought it was a badge of honor. Like I'm going to work till midnight every night. And that proves, you know, how effective I am and how committed I am. But then guess what? The next day you are not as productive. Hmm. And then it's this vicious cycle, right? Because you're working tired, which means your brain's less effective. So, you know, and I've had so many clients who struggled with this and, you know, what I say is like, you need to set something up so that you have to stop work 
right? So it's, you know, maybe you have to go meet a friend or you, you know, I had one client who's like, I've always wanted to take pottery. I'm going to take a pottery class that starts at six, right? So it's like figuring out if, if you feel like it's too hard to do, creating something that's going to force you to stop work and force you to recharge. Um, because when you recharge and you relax, you're so much more productive the next day. And when you get good sleep, you're so much more productive the next day. I had so many clients coming to me because they couldn't, they couldn't sleep enough because they're like, no, no, I have to work till midnight. And then I get up at six and I'm, you know, I can't get enough sleep. And it's like, well, we got to change that because sleep like is to your brain, like sleep is the magic thing that makes your brain work. Right. And when your brain is working more effectively, you're way more productive with way less effort. Absolutely. I mean, I can only think the number of hours that I stayed awake to work, I was probably getting like, like 20% of the work done that I should have been in, you know, all those hours. Yeah. I mean, the research says that your productivity falls off a cliff after working 40 hours a week. Like it just totally drops. So I have a question about that. Like I'm, I'm thinking about my husband specifically. So like he, let's say he's in meetings for a chunk of his work day. And then he has, you know, it's the end of the day and he maybe will take a break to be with family, whatever. And then at night he'll go back to work, like, at, you know, from home or whatever, Yeah. And- because he is so behind on answering emails and deadlines and whatever. So how do you, how does one become more productive? Who's like, what do you suggest for people that are so constantly in a backlog, I guess? Yes. And, you know, part of, part of his challenge or part of everyone's challenge is meetings, 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 Mm -hmm. because you can't get your work done when you're in meetings. Right. And um, so one of the things that I tell people to do is to block the first hour of their day, because if you block that first hour of your day, you refuse to take meetings. That first hour is your most productive time. Your brain is fresh you've got still good ability to focus and to concentrate and you can get so much more done in the first hour of your day than if you try and do that between nine and 11 at night or whatever. Right. So it's those, that's the first thing I do. And the other thing that I do and and clients are like, I can't say no to meetings. And I'm like, actually you can, you just, you need to ask the, like when someone invites you to a meeting, you need to ask them what the agenda is and what your specific role in that meeting is to clarify whether you need to be there or not. And I think, especially with having to work from home and having to work online, we've amped up the number of meetings and we've, you know, often I hear clients, they're like, I've invited everyone because I just want to make sure that they're all included and they're all, but it's like, you know, to really ask the question, do you need me at this meeting? Am I a decision maker? What's my role in this meeting? Or is this something that you could just send me a summary of, right? Because that frees up a bit of time during the day. And it's also like often people invite you to a meeting because they want to include you, but they don't necessarily need you there. So they, for them, it's freeing as well, right? When you ask those questions. And the other thing that I really say to clients is to take breaks every 90 minutes. And this is based on research by Tony Schwartz, who wrote a fabulous book called The Way We're Working Isn't Working. And what they found is that our energy cycles for you know, we can go for about 90 minutes and then we need a break to recharge. And so if you even just take a quick 10 minute break and, you know, I used this while I was writing my book, again, it's such good incentive. You have to do the stuff you're telling everyone to do. And I wrote that book. That was, I wrote that book in six months while I was working full time and parenting full time. And it was because I booked the first hour of my day when my brain was fresh to do the writing and I took breaks every 90 minutes. It was a total game changer for my productivity. And it's amazing how much fresher your brain is when you can give it some breaks. And when you work during a time when your brain is, it's fresh, it's easy, right? It becomes very easy in a way that it's very hard late at night. Yes, I totally agree. I've tried to do some of that where I block the mornings. I don't like to schedule a lot of meetings in the mornings because I know that is my productive time, like you said. It's funny, I was actually, I had a session with my one-on-one client yesterday and she was talking the same thing. Like she's booked all day long in meetings and can't get any work done. And I actually referred to you because I was prepping for this (laughs) podcast interview 
and what her company like starting next week actually decided they are only allowing meetings, be, internal meetings between 11 and four. So they're trying, but you know, it's a hard because this is easy to tell someone to do this, but like people that are in client service, right. That are accepting meetings from clients. That's how they're making their money. Like, Absolutely. how do you just say, no, I can't, I can't yeah. do this meeting. Right. It's cause it's a culture, like you said, but like you also said, there are many cultures around the world. They have a very different perspective that are doing very well yeah. from longevity and all those things and stress. Yeah. So I love like and, insight as to practically yes. how you can make this happen in a culture yeah. that isn't quite caught up. Absolutely. And I do, I have a lot of clients that are in workplaces where it's like, no, 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 you have to be, you know, in these meetings. And so what I say to them is, you know, that nine to midnight, you're working every night, replace that with a six to 7 a.m., right? Or like get into work an hour earlier than your workday starts and then your meetings start. If you can't block that first hour of your workday, don't work at night. It's just, it's so counterproductive because your brain is tired. So it's less effective. And also you need that recharge time. You really, really need that recharge time. So you're relaxed. And when you get good sleep, when you wake up that first hour of your day, you're so much more productive. And, you know, ideally you do work in a workplace. You can present this work, this research and say, hey, this is the reason I'm blocking the first hour of my day. And I know there are people that are just, you know, unfortunately the workplaces haven't caught up to the neuroscience and the research of what's actually making people most effective. So in those cases, I just say to my clients, like stop working at night and start working in your morning because you're going to be way more effective. You're, and, and honestly, the clients have done, I have one client, she just laughed because she's like, no, no, I'm a night owl and this is my time. And yes. you know, I work till midnight or one. And I used to be like that too, 100%. I was like, the only time I can write or be productive starts at about 10 p.m. That was me, 100%. And it does take probably a week or two to switch over. But it like, she just, she was laughing at herself and at how, how resistant she was to me because she was like, I'm easily getting twice as much done in that hour in the morning as I was during three or four hours at night. It's just, it's all about working with your brain, not against your brain. Well, and I hear a lot from my clients too, especially they are like, I know a number of people I've worked with that, that they literally say that I'm a night owl. I can't function in the morning or my brain doesn't work well in the morning. So I love how you're saying, just try it because I mean, me personally, like, I feel like my brain doesn't function after 930 PM. I like can see the dive it takes in terms of my thought process. Yeah. So, you know, everybody is obviously different, but I do have to believe that after, you know, a solid night's sleep, you wake up, you're refreshed, you're ready to go. And I'm absolutely the same. And I am a real advocate for um, like working in the way that works for you, right? So mm-hmm. I can't get up at six in the morning and write. I tried that, right? It's like, everybody says, oh, do that, do that. And I would get up and I would write and I would write like 10 pages and they were all absolute crap. Like I just, <laughs> it's not my time, right? Yes. So, but I can work from 7.30 to 8.30, right? Like that works. So it's like mm-hmm. figuring out when is your best energy time. And, and also like I've noticed once I started doing this, I really noticed it's like, I can feel it's exactly what you said, Marnie. I can feel my brain getting tired. And when I feel my brain getting tired, I now have learned to not push through, but to stop and take a 10, 15 minute break, go for a walk, drink a glass of water, have an apple, like just do these little things and then come back. And I think in our culture, we have been trained to push through power through go, go, go. But when we back off and when we listen and we go, oh, I feel my brain getting tired. Like mm-hmm. you can feel it when you, when you notice it's like, oh yeah, I, it's taking me longer to think about this. It's taking me longer to type this out. I can't figure out how to word this email. This is the clue. It's time yes. to go <laughs> and take a break. Well, and <laughs> speaking of that, I wanted to clarify one thing you said earlier, you mentioned, um, taking 90, you know, after 90 minutes of work, taking a break, what is your suggested amount of time? 10 minutes. If you can pull off 10 10 minute break, 10 to 15 minutes, that's gold. If you can't just stand up, walk around your room and do three stretches, like Mm -hmm. just something because it's the brain needs to disconnect and 10 minutes is enough time that it actually recharges your powers of focus and concentration 
And he, but here's the thing about breaks. And I, I, I had to learn this myself and I've had to train my clients to do this too. A true break means you're not on a screen. Yeah. So, so many people are like, oh, great. I'm going to take a break and go on social media. That is not right. a break for your brain. So I, you know, I love going for walks. That's my break. Cause it's also good for your body, right. To get your body moving. So if you can just, you know, even if it's miserable weather, I obviously right now it's beautiful out and it's great to go for a quick walk, but even in the miserable weather, I would go out and just walk and move my body because it's also, um, I also would find, you know, and the research backs this up, especially when I was writing, if I was taking it, you know, if I was working on something, it's really hard and I couldn't quite get it. I go for a break and I go for my walk and I come back and I'd be like, even on the walk, I'd be like, aha, I know exactly what to do now. Mm -hmm. I know how to deal with this. Right. And the research has found that 60% of the time we work out a problem through our conscious mind, right? We go through the really tough process. Okay. I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to do it that way. 40% of the time our subconscious can take over and sort it out. But that means we have to give ourselves breaks to yeah. let the subconscious take over, right? If we're constantly in the working hard in the conscious mind, we never, we never get that shortcut where the subconscious just works it out for us. Yes. And yeah. I think when you are in those periods where you're trying to figure out a problem, like where you're working, disconnecting without the screen, or even if you're going on a walk, don't bring your phone with you. So you're not distracted by texts and emails or even putting on a podcast, which of course we love to do too, um, because you're just sitting with your thoughts and then it allows that your mind time to like, maybe some of the chatter clears and then you can think more clearly and come up with that new creative idea or whatever it is that you're struggling with. Absolutely. And I, I think it's, you know, you've, you've touched on something so key, right? Which is that we never actually just let our brains be quiet and relax, right? Because we're always, there's a text coming in or there's something to look at on social media or there's a podcast. There's always something to do. And because we live in a culture that really values doing, we don't just relax and, you know, do nothing and think about nothing and just go for a walk and look at the trees or, you know, breathe in the fresh air. And that's what's really, really good for our brains is that do nothing in that quiet space. And that's what actually helps us be more productive, ironically. Well, and it's funny because I always say I do my best thinking in the shower and it's because no one can get to me. Like (laughs) there's no one that can reach me because even on a walk, I mean, I do a wonderful thinking on walks too but there's neighbors I run into or my phone may ring if I, or my watch or, you know, there, there are some distractions and I, I love the time of the walks, but the shower is like me all alone. Nobody can get to me. So, and that's what we need to create more of in our lives though, is that nobody can get to be time. Yeah. 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 Just disconnection from the world. So speaking of distractions, you know, what, What have you found to be the biggest distractions for adults? Well, you know, probably like everybody else, the phone is just like Mm -hmm. the best distraction in the world. Yeah. And, and you know, what's, but what was really interesting for me was when I was doing the research for working well, I came across this research about how social media is designed to addict us. And that, that really changed my relationship with social media because I realized that I was addicted and that, you know, the reason I was addicted was because the, the, all of the sites are designed to increase your dopamine, right? Which gets you addicted. And so for me, I was like, oh, I need to do things differently, right? So I actually removed the apps from my phone. And I've realized that what I, when I'm looking at it on my computer, right? If I go onto Facebook to do some work stuff on my computer, I don't scroll the same way. I don't get sucked in the same way. So that was a big shift for me. And it was hard. It was really hard to make that change. I was addicted. I wanted to go in and see the likes and to see the comments and to engage with people. But when I was able to do it on my computer from a place of like, no, this is work. And I'm setting my time limit of half an hour to do this work. It totally changed my relationship with it. The other thing that I found in the research that I was doing for the book was that if you are working with your phone on your desk, it decreases mm-hmm. your productivity just by having the phone nearby. So now if I'm working, I like when I'm working and sleeping, my phone is not in the same room as me. 
which has really, really changed things because, you know, unfortunately, even the visual of the phone is a bit of a cue to pick it up and check it, right? So mm-hmm. to just have it physically in another room um, has increased my productivity and improved my sleep. So I really encourage people to do that. The other thing that has popped up as, you know, a huge time suck is task switching. Mm. So, um, you know, this great study they did, they did it um, through one of the bigger universities. I can't remember which one it was right now. And, and what they did was they, they looked at people who task switched and they found that people task switched on average, like every, I think it was 22 minutes or something because a notification pops up or um, you remember something, you distract yourself. Oh, I forgot to send that email. I better go do that. And here's what's fascinating is that you think, oh, I'll just go send the email and then I'll go right back to that presentation I was working on. Nope. They found it takes 25 minutes to get back to your original task. (laughs) So task switching actually sucks up to two hours every single day because you're either getting distracted by something external, right? A notification pops up and you go deal with that, or you have your own internal distraction where you're like, oh, I forgot to do that. And then off you go. And the other thing they found, which I certainly could relate to, is they they did, you know, that NASA stress scale. Your stress is off the roof when you're getting interrupted and when you're getting having to to um, switch tasks. And I definitely find this, you know, if I'm like trying to get work done and my kids are like, you know, yelling at me or asking me things or, you know, my husband's like, I need you to do this right now. It's like, ah, I'm so stressed. Whereas if I'm spending an hour working and my door is closed and nobody's talking to me, I'm not stressed at all. It's fabulous. I love it. So I really, really, you know, with my clients, I say like, you you know, people in offices are so keen on open door time. I'm like, you need to schedule yourself some closed door time. And that closed door time needs to include turning off your notifications, putting your phone in another room and having one hour of really focused time because you will get three times as much done and you'll be way less stressed out. So really the, the, the interruptions, I think is such a huge time suck. Yes, I completely agree. And you just feel you're happier when you get that work done and you're less stressed, like you said, and it's only a, one hour. We're not saying like lock yourself in your office for eight hours a day or anything like that. Um, and it just has such a ripple effect on how you interact and engage with your work colleagues or, you know, the people on your team or your family, all those relationships, like you alluded to earlier. So absolutely. And the other thing that's, that's fascinating about the brain science and the the research is that dopamine is the chemical that motivates us. Right. And it's a brain chemical that we uh, produce naturally. And one of the biggest things that produces dopamine is getting stuff done. So when we're (laughs) constantly being interrupted, we don't get stuff done and then we don't have more dopamine. So, you know, I have so many clients who are like, oh, I'm not feeling very motivated and I just need to pressure myself and get more stuff done. And I'm like, no, actually the exact opposite is what you need to do. So if you're having trouble feeling motivated, you're having trouble getting stuff done, there's really easy like brain hacks that you can do, right? The first is usually if we don't want to do something, we're not feeling motivated. It's because we're, we're focusing on the pain of doing it and, you know, the difficulty of doing it. And the brain is hardwired to avoid pain, but the brain is also hardwired to, have, to seek potential reward. And what they found is that our dopamine spikes when we're thinking about reward. So if you've got something that you're reluctant to do, think about and associate the potential reward of getting it done, right? So you've got this big presentation, it's hanging over you, you don't want to do it. It's like, well, once I get it done, I'm going to feel so good. I'm going to feel free. I'm going to have delivered what I'm meant to deliver. You focus on that, your dopamine naturally spikes. So you're naturally more motivated. And then when you get it done, you get another huge rush of dopamine, which means you're more motivated to get the next thing done. It's so interesting. Also, you mentioned, I think you called it task switching. Mm -hmm. And I used to like pride myself on being a multitasker. And just, I used to be like, oh, I'm the greatest multitasker and I can do this and I can do that. And, and, and the last few years, I've really realized that I accomplish so much more when I focus on one task instead of focusing on five tasks at once. And, and um, I- yeah. And I, I can even tell a difference in 
my stress level. Um, and like you mentioned, you know, the interruptions with the kids and the cell phones. And I definitely have my cell phone on my desk next to my computer when I'm working and a text will pop up and someone will ask me a question or whatever. And it definitely will pull me out of whatever I'm doing and into that. And then that may send me off to go do something else. And then, you know, it's like this spiral and maybe I won't get back to that task that I was initially setting out to do for 30 minutes. So I, I'm going to try what you're saying, try and, you know, put my phone in a drawer or somewhere where I can't see it, you know, when and, I'm and doing you, that really focused work. Yeah. And if you, honestly, if you do it, cause it's hard. Right. And I've, I have struggled with like, what do you mean? I'm not going to have my phone with me or what, you know, and same thing. My clients have really been like, I need it there. And I'm like, you don't for one hour. You absolutely don't. Yeah. And you'll, you'll notice how much more productive you are. And, but here's the thing, and this happens to all of us when it's not there, we're like, maybe I should just go out and check it. Like you have to actually retrain your brain, right? Yes. And, you know, yeah. On the note too, of what you were saying about multitasking, again, we live in a culture that values multitasking and thinks that this is great that you can multitask. And, and when I was, I, I read David Rock has this fabulous book called Your Brain at Work. So it's all about the neuroscience. It's a bit of a, it, it was a hard read. I'm not saying that was an easy read, yeah. but um one of the things that they found in there is, uh, is Harold Pashler did this study and he found that when we multitask, it takes our intelligence level from that of a Harvard MBA to that of an eight-year-old. Oh, that, that's really sad. <laughs> yes, it really yes. shifted my approach to multitasking, <laughs> wow. right? I was like, okay, time to do things a little bit differently here. And again, like, I think in workplaces too, there's all this pressure to like work long hours, don't take breaks, multitask, because we think that's the way to be most productive. And we think that that's showing the most commitment to work. So, you know, I've had to, I've had to educate my clients and I've had to ask my clients to educate their colleagues. Right. So I say to them, like, when you tell people that you're scheduling that first hour of your day to not be interrupted, tell them why, when you're closing your door, tell them why, explain the research, explain how it makes you more productive. And honestly, within two weeks, people are so much more productive that I've had their managers call me and say, can you please come and teach all of my staff this? Because I don't know what you're doing with this person, but they're, they've doubled their productivity. And I'd like you to do that with the rest of us. So you see the results very quickly, but you have to, it takes some willpower and some self-control to change the habit, right? And to do things differently. And that's why I often teach people systems because when you just create a new system, you just follow the system and then you don't even have to rely on the willpower because what research has found is when we're trying to make change, most of us rely on willpower and it's really, really hard and it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So when we have a system to follow, we just follow the system. And then we don't even have to rely on willpower. We just use the system. That makes a lot of sense. And I'm wondering if you can apply these systems that I think we're probably going to dive into a little more to someone who's at home as well, because there may be someone who's not, you know, in a workplace environment, but they're actually even, you know, maybe a stay at home mom, but they still have a huge list of tasks that they need to do on a daily basis. A hundred percent. And I feel like, I feel like actually when I'm you know, when I am at home or, and I'm not having my work day, I need my systems even more because there's less structure. (laughs) Right. And it's so easy to just be like, Oh, like I knew I had to do the laundry and I know I had to pick a kid up at some point, but I also, there was other stuff I had to do, but what was that? So, yeah, I feel like systems are, uh, I am, I'm a bit of a free spirit and I'm very resistant to systems, but once I put some systems in place, it's basically, it's just, it's creating habits right? Creating habits and, and training yourself to do things in a certain way. And that way is way more productive and way more effective. And it's like, it's that whole concept of working smarter, not harder. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, I, now I love it. It it feels, it makes my life feel easier and anything that makes my life feel easier. I am all for. Right. So what would be like one of the main processes that you would recommend someone to implement in order to really get some of these habits flowing and 
integrated into their life. Yeah. So if you can schedule that first hour of your day, right. And have it be the first productive hour of your day, right. We've talked about this, right. When you know, your brain is working and functioning. So uh, for some people that is like five 30 to six 30, that's their optimal time. So um, here, here's the system that I teach a lot of my clients, right. Is you start your day with 15 minutes of meditation. So it's not, I, you don't get straight into it. You give your brain that quiet time. And there's lots of really good uh, meditation apps. I really love Insight Timer because they have tons of free uh, meditations and there's lots of different options. I also really love Calm. Those are my two that I kind of go to. Um, I've also got a meditation that I, that I do for people as well. Um, but if you can start your day in a calm, happy, positive mind state, you are going to be naturally 31% more productive. The research has proven this. So what I have clients do is I'm like, you start your day meditating. You don't start your day checking your phone. <laughs> you don't yes. start your day dealing yes. with text. You start your day meditating. So 15 minutes and then try to, you know, just do five or 10 minutes of movement, right? So it's, for me, I do some stretches. Some of my clients like to go for walks. So if I've got the kids, I, you know, sometimes we'll do a little dance party, right? Just something that gets the body moving. So that's the, the way you begin the day really, which is giving your mind what it needs and giving your body what it needs. Mm -hmm. And then that first hour of your time, you identify before you do that time, what your priorities are. So I ask my clients to identify their top three priorities every day. So at the beginning of that hour, you're identifying your top three priorities and that's what you're working on. Not like, oh, what am I going to do today? It's like, <laughs> no, you know exactly what those top three priorities are. And that's what the hour is for because that's your most productive time. That's when your brain is your most focused. So just spend that time on your priorities. And then the rest of the day, you know, frankly, Meetings are other people's priorities, usually, right? Sometimes it's your meeting, it's your priority, but often you're responding to other people's priorities in emails or in meetings. So that first hour, so that's like, if you just do that, that's a system, right? 15 minutes of meditation. Well, honestly, some people are gonna have to start with five or 10 because meditation can be tricky. But if you start with five or 10, you get a little win, you do your meditation, you do your stretching, you get wins because you've done it right? So you feel good. You've got the dopamine. And then you know what your three priorities are. You start your hour getting stuff done. And then you've got the dopamine. You're highly motivated and you're very energized. So that's like a quick, easy system to start your day with. And again, it'll take, you know, they say it takes three weeks to build habits. So don't, you know, don't feel like, oh, I did it two days and then I didn't do it. And now I, I'm giving up. Forget it. Yeah. It's like, actually just do it. It, it will work. And if you just keep doing it, it will work. And you'll notice the impacts and the results very quickly. And then the other thing, it's not really a system, but it's like, I actually have my clients schedule their breaks into their calendars mm -hmm. so that nobody can block time there. And it actually pops up as a, it's time to go take a break because it's so easy to get sucked in. And, you know, four hours later, you're, oh, whoops, I forgot. So just put it in the calendar, have it pop up as a notification, and then off you go. Yes, I think those right. are great ideas. And I love that you're, the science supports this dopamine, because I think a lot of times people then reach for other, you know, sugar, caffeine, and other things mm -hmm. to kind of boost their energy. And you're laying out these processes and habits that will naturally support a dopamine rush, right? Yes. And I mean... The other thing that I, I've gotten really into is the happiness factor, right? Like basically what they found is if we can get our brain into a positive state, we are 23% less stressed. We're 31% more productive. Our health is 39% better and our relationships improve by 26%. Like it is incredible what mm -hmm. being in a positive and happy state can do for your brain and for your life. And I feel like, again, in our culture, we don't think about self-care. We don't think about making ourselves happy. We don't think about, you know, what can I do to really feel good? But if you can start your day feeling good and in a positive, happy state, you're going to naturally have a way better day. And I have so many clients 
who are like, oh, well, I, like when I wake up, I roll over and pick up the phone and check out the news and my emails and I'm already stressed, mm-hmm. which is why I'm like, uh-uh, replace that behavior, right? They've also found that a habit is much easier to replace than it is to break. So now yeah. pick up the phone, click on insight timer and do a meditation. And even if you're just lying in your bed, do a meditation for 15 minutes that puts you in a positive, happy state. That's a way better way to start your day. And you're naturally going to be more productive and healthier and happier and have better relationships. Like who doesn't want that? Absolutely. And I, I mean, I couldn't agree more with what you're saying. And Stephanie and I talk a lot about morning routines, which is very similar to what you're setting up is basically a type of a morning routine. And I think that it's important for our listeners to understand that they can tailor this morning routine to what works for them, you know? Maybe they want to do a 30 minute workout or, you know, there's different ways to kind of set it up. But the important thing being, you know, you're not getting on your technology right away. You're doing something for your own self-care to set the tone of the day so that you feel like you're energized. Yeah. And then you're better for everyone in your life. Like that's what I really realized. Right. Cause I used to be like, okay, check. I would check my emails before I'd even seen my kids. So I was mm-hmm. already stressed yeah. out when I was dealing right. with my kids. It's like, this isn't fair. Like, right. it's not fair to them. Yeah. yeah. So speaking of stress, and I know you talk about this in your book, that you know, we, we said working well, 12 simple strategies to manage stress and increase productivity. Um, in your research and what you found and working with your clients, like what are the biggest sources of workplace stress? stress? Workplace and also just life stress in you know, general. Yeah, I think the biggest one right now is just juggling too many things, right? That is, it's, it's a huge source of stress because it, it creates that task switching, right? And, you know, the reality is that people have, they have too many demands on them and too much pressure. Um, you know, some of the other things that I, um, I found not just in my research, but also in my coaching and teaching work, uh, relationships, right? Interpersonal mm-hmm. relationships at work cause a lot of stress because, you know, it's different, different people, different styles of work, um, different ways of being. Um, those interactions can cause a lot of stress. Role clarity and understanding your role and the expectations on you um, cause people a lot of stress because often they'll be asked to do things that either they're not given clear expectations about what they're asked to do, or they feel like, I don't sure that this actually falls within my role so um you know i have one of my courses is on strengthening your relationships in the workplace and strengthening your communication and it's a lot about how do you ask for role clarity how do you have difficult conversations how do you give feedback because i those things really impact people those are the things people take home at night that they stress out about right it's like ah um but you know the other thing that i found in my research um was this, it was a a study that was published in the Washington Post. And what it found was that people who reacted to their everyday hassles and, you know, everyday little workplace stressors with really high stress responses, they had the same mortality rates as people who had highly stressful events in their lives. And to me, that is a huge incentive to choose how to respond to your workplace stress and your life stress differently. Mm -hmm. And And, you know, I really focus on giving, you know, in the book, I focus on giving people tools In my courses, I focus on giving people tools to change your stress response, because if you're reacting to those workplace stresses or those just everyday hassles of like traffic or difficult people with huge stress responses, you have like higher risk of mortality, right? Higher risk for heart disease and stroke. It's like you, you want to do things differently. It's not worth dying over. Right. So how do you, you know, really focus back? I'm always asking people like focus back in on yourself and your responses and how you show up, because that's the piece you can always control. You can't control what happens around you. You can't control other people as much as you might like to, but you can control how you respond and how you show up. So can you share a success story maybe of one of your clients who, you know, was in that really like stressed out or overworked um, mode, I guess, and how you help them become more productive, less stressed, happier. 
Yeah, sure. I, you know, I've, I've so many that I just like, it makes me happy to think of, right? This is like what I love <laughs> about my work. Um, but, you know, one person that really stands out for me was someone that I, I worked with, you know, she came to me when she was just like, she was like, I, I can't take it. I have a very difficult boss. I have way too many demands on me. She, she basically worked from, she would start work at about eight in the morning and she would work until one or two every morning. And, you know, when she came to me, she was like, my marriage is suffering. My health is suffering. I am miserable, but I cannot see a way to do this differently. And so, and she was someone that really responded to research, right? So it was like when I could back up, like, listen, (laughs) this working until two every morning, like your brain is exhausted. It's not working. So she, and I think that's what was so satisfying. That's what I love about, you know, when people come and they're willing to make the change, right? Mm -hmm. So she, um, and she, she said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to believe you. I'm going to trust you. And the, basically she made three changes. The first thing that she did was she booked dinner with her husband every night at six. She was like, my, you know, she said, cause my husband works really late at night too. We both, we both love our work and we're passionate, but she booked dinner with her husband every night at six. And so she could not work past six and he could not work past six. So that improved their relationship. And they did stuff together in the evening that was relaxing and enjoyable. They both liked to run. So they actually started training for a marathon. So it was like she was she was getting back to some of the things that she loved. The other thing that she did was she did my one hour every morning. And she said that changed her work life. Like she was like, the reason I had to work till one or two every night was because I could never get work done during the day because I had all these meetings and all this stuff going on. But in that one hour every morning, I got so much more done. And then she also scheduled the breaks. So these are little things, right? These are not big things, but they made a huge difference to her life and to her marriage, which to me was the most important thing. I was like, I don't care if you have to get a different job or go on stress leave, but you love your husband. Well, let's get this back on track. And the other thing that I actually did, I worked with her a fair bit on was setting boundaries with her very difficult and demanding boss and giving feedback and standing up for herself because those things are really important and they're really hard to do, but they're really important. And so she was able within probably about a month, she was able to have very different kinds of conversation with her manager to say, no, actually that's unrealistic. I'm not able to take that on right now. Or if you want me to take that on, I need to do something. I need to give you something back. So I think that that's another key piece that's more of a coaching piece, right? It's like giving people the tools to have those conversations. And, you know, I go through it a fair bit in the book about giving feedback and setting boundaries. Um, and I think that's a really, really important element of, of working well. Yes. I think I love all these suggestions because they're, you know what, they're free, right? Stephanie, you're not telling people to go like outsource all the things that are, you know, keeping them stressed about their house or whatever. It's like, no, take control of your schedule and your life, which will then have a ripple effect on your happiness and how you interact and just everything, right? What it's like keeping yourself that the self care is not selfish because it really is then bringing your best self forward for everyone else that you interact with, um, which is awesome. And I know we talked a little bit about your book, um, but maybe if you want to spend just a couple of minutes, let's just sharing how it's structured and what drove you to write it. And you wrote it very quickly, you said, because you had all these processes in place and um, productivity tips. But I love how it's laid out each of these chapters and just that there's lots of thought provoking questions at the end of each chapter to get you thinking and then tips and strategies that you can implement. So if you just want to share a little bit about that. Thanks. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I mainly wrote it because I, I can't coach everyone, right. And not everyone right. afford coaching. And I just like, I was seeing the impacts that I was having in the coaching and the teaching. And I was having so many people say like, is there anything else? So I thought I'd love to be able to really kind of walk people through everything that I teach and my, my process of it around coaching. So yeah, it is each chapter is, you know, really a, an area of focus, right? So one is, you know, like one is on taking action, to reduce your stress and, you know, taking personal responsibility or, you know, one is on like having difficult conversations and all the tools that you need for that. But as you say, I do really want people to have that kind of coaching experience. So it's like, that's why I have all those questions 
So basically I use a lot of stories because I think that's how we learn and that's how it's most interesting for us, right? So I share a lot of stories from my coaching clients and from uh, you know some of my teaching to kind of illustrate the points, but then I give people quite specific strategies and even, you know, like in my, how to give feedback, I teach that feedback model, right? So that people can use it. And then at the end, I really ask people like some questions to help them take action because what, what research has found too is that one of the biggest reasons that we take action is we've had an insight that makes us want to take action or makes us want to make a change. So that's why I ask those questions is to help people generate some of the insights that will help them take action. And then I obviously lay out very specific action steps that people can take to be able to see their results. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a fun book, I think. Like it's, it's, it's kind of this fun combination of like my life and my struggles. And then also, you know, people that I've helped and the stories and then also like actions. I think it's super fun. You know, I've read a lot of these similar types books that haven't really resonated with me always, but like you said, just the way that it's laid out and the stories. I'm a big, um, I'm a big fan of personal stories as well. Cause I think it's like, Oh, that, that person has something similar to what I'm dealing with right now and look how they were able to solve it. So I think it's a great book. Highly recommend that if this topic piques your interest or if you're at all stressed, or if you want more hours in your day, which I think most of us do to go out and buy Stephanie's latest book. Um, and I know Stephanie, you've already peppered in so many different, like, practical tips and strategies throughout this conversation. But, you know, if there's someone out there that's feeling like, oh my gosh, so overwhelmed um, with stress and productivity, where should someone start? Like, what's just like one or two things they could do maybe even today or tomorrow? Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, start with taking breaks. So start with noticing that your brain is tired. That's the first piece. Most of us were just go, go, go. We don't even notice, but stop powering through, notice that your brain is tired and fight the instinct to push through and go and take a break because it, it, it changes things. You're going to feel more energized and you're going to be more productive. So that is such a huge one. Um, the other thing that I teach my clients to do is box breathing, which is, it's very, very simple, but it's just, you know, basically you breathe in for four seconds, you hold your breath for four seconds, you breathe out for four seconds, you hold your breath for four seconds. Even if you just do that for a couple of minutes, it really decreases the stress response, right? Because you're getting deep oxygen to your brain. It's settling the entire nervous system down. So it's kind of, it's a quick, easy thing to do. But I mean, honestly, Stephanie, I feel like, you know, when people are super stressed out and overwhelmed, they need to do a bit of a reset. They need to stop. Like that's the first piece It's just, and when you're stressed and overwhelmed, you're going, going, going. But what I usually say to my clients is like, we need to spend the first hour looking at the sources of your stress and really digging deep down. So, no, so not just, I have too much work to do. Well, why do you have too much work to do? Cause I can't say no to my boss. Okay. Well then we need to have a different conversation, right? So stop, identify what's stressing you out, identify the source of that stress and then also identify the impact that stress is having on you and the impact it's having on the people in your life that you care about, because that's a huge motivation to make a change. And once you know what the source of the stress is, it's a lot easier to make that change. So of course, there's little things like taking breaks or box breathing or scheduling that hour in, but you need to first slow down, figure out what, what are the sources of the stress what's the impact and how do you need to approach it? I think that's really important. And I think that we, because we're constantly pushing ourselves and thinking that we should power through, we're resistant to taking that time. But when you slow down and take that time and figure it out, you go way faster afterwards. Well, and I think it's, I love what you're saying. I think that is fantastic advice. And I think it's something that people should do often, right? Because those stressors can change and the priorities can change, right? It's so just because you're addressing this today doesn't mean three months from now, it's going to be the same scenario. So I think that's great life advice, just moving forward in general. Yeah. I, 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 I do it all the time, right? It's Mm -hmm. like, and I think that, that it is that it's the ability to slow down and notice 
like even notice when you're irritable. Okay, well, why am I feeling irritable right now? What's going on for me? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's because I have 27 things to do and only an hour to do them. Okay, why do I have 27 things to do? Oh, I said yes again. I did that. I, I always say yes, you know, like whatever it is, right? Just identifying that source so that you can make a change at the source makes a huge difference. Well, Stephanie, this has been amazing. And you have given our listeners and both of us so much great advice. Um, And I highly recommend that everybody goes out and buys your book. And if people want to contact you to work with you, how we'll link everything up in the show notes. But if you just want to let everybody know the best way to reach you. Sure. So my email is stephanie at manage to engage.com. Um, and my website is managed to engage.com. So there's obviously I've got lots of courses on there and lots of resources on there. I've also got a, a best day everyday blueprint there, which has a lot of these strategies that I've talked about for kind of, you know, how do you have really good days and be happy and be productive and have great relationships. So um, that's, that's a resource on my website. Um, and then I've also got um, a course called supercharge your days which um, is on my website, but is also on stephanieberrymantraining.com. It's an even better deal on there. Um, So if you go on there, it really explains the course. um, And really, it's all about the neuroscience of how we can be most effective and teaching people systems to be able to put these things into place. So those are two two ways that you can find me. And um, thank you so much for having me. It's been, I love these conversations, right? It's super fun to connect. And I love helping people figure this stuff out because I really do think that, you know, we do, we get, I love that quote from Mary Oliver, right? What will you do with your one wild and precious life? I love that mm. quote too. That is one of my favorites yes. actually. Yeah. And it's, it's, yeah. it's a good quote to remind yourself of all the time, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cause it is, it's one wild, one precious life and let's enjoy it. You know, let's take care of ourselves. Let's have fun. Let's connect with the people we love. Let's do work that we love in a way that fills us up, not drains us. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I almost feel like this is a response. This could be your response to the last question that we always ask all of our guests. And that is, what does the art of living well mean to you? Yeah, you know, I think like the, the, the longer I live, <laughs> the more life experiences I have, that like for me, the art of living well really is loving my people well and feeling like I have been the best version of myself for the people that I love and I've been there for them and I've connected with them and that, like that's it right at the end of the day mm. you know you you have your people and that's really really important and my work is fabulous and I love my work and and I, I do think that you know it's it's having the things that fill you up and then it's allowing those things to fill you and not drain you because I think when we're passionate we can kind of go overboard a little bit and it can drain us. So for me, that art of living well is it's taking everything to the point where it fills us, right? Our relationships, our people, our work, and not letting it get to the point where it drains us. So finding that, that place of like a balance fill, I'm filled and this is lovely. And now I'm going to take a break and fill more. I love that. And I, I love how you said it to fill and not drain. Yes. Yeah, and it's, I think we live in a culture that just asks us to drain mm-hmm. and we need to, we need to push back and say, I'm going to fill because that's the best thing I can do for myself and for everyone in my life. Yes. Well, thank you for all your insight and inspiration. Um, and this was really motivating. So I know a lot of people are going to take so much away from this conversation and start to implement many of these tips and strategies that you share today into their life. I know I will, and Marnie will as well. So wonderful, wonderful having you. talking to you guys. And I'm going to go take my walk now. So it's perfect timing, right? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Without the phone. That's great. Well, Well, thank you. I decided today, sorry, I was walking. I had my phone in my hand and it kept dropping. And I was like, that was a sign that I should not have the phone with me. Cause it's, you know, I want to break my phone. Right. So I, I'm going to try to do that too. Oh, that's great. So well, have a wonderful you. day. Yeah. You too. Enjoy the walk and enjoy the phone free time. And uh, yeah, it's been fabulous chatting with both of you. Thanks for all the amazing work that you do in the world, helping everyone live well. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much for listening to the Art of Living Well podcast. We are so grateful that you joined us today. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend or anyone else you think may benefit from this information. We'd love for you to subscribe to our podcast, leave us a review, and tag the Art of Living Well podcast on social media. If you want more inspiration in between episodes, you can find us on social media at the Art of Living underscore well on Instagram and Facebook, where we will share snippets from our daily lives and our journey to living well. Mm-hmm.